Good evening. Thank you very much, Judy. And I would also I would like to thank uh, National Dawn for Democracy and the Foreign Policy Association who invited me to speak here today. And my special thanks to the president of NED, Carl Gershman, who couldn't be here today, but who has been working tirelessly to support our cause in Russia. It is essential to have voices around the world committed to the understanding that human freedom is the most important of society's values. And I hope that together we can bring that message to every corner of Russia and the world. What is left of Russian democracy is on the endangered list, and this crisis has implications for the world, not just for Russians and our neighbors. It matters because of the harm of dictatorial or chaotic Russia can cause. It matters because of the benefits on free and democratic Russia can provide as a true member of the free world. It matters because justice and freedom are not mere words. History teaches us that ideas was worth fighting for and worth dying for. History also teaches us that injustice and oppression rarely obey borders, especially where Russia is concerned. Instead, they spread like a cancer. The current Kremlin regime under Vladimir Putin is in some ways a new and difficult cancer to diagnose and treat. But it's not completely resistant yet, and I hope we may yet force it into a mission or cut it out entirely without killing the patient. It will take strength and courage to achieve this. As Dwight Eisenhower said in his 1953 inaugural speech, history does not long entrust the care of freedom to the weak or the timid. I'm here to talk today about the prospects for democracy in Russia, but it's also important to think about why we should all care about Russian democracy. I, like many of you, believe that democracy and liberty are simply good and essential human values that should be promoted to the maximum for their own sake. But there are many so-called pragmatists among us and in many administrations. They have a vocabulary of values they say are much more important than human liberty or worse, mutually exclusive. They use words like stability and good partner. Those with good memories realize that these are too often called code words for repression and dictator. The word partner implies a choice. People who are not free cannot be good partners. People who are not free have little to say in their own destiny. They are manipulated, ignored, and oppressed. And we must distinguish between an administration and the citizens it dominates. We must distinguish between the actions of the Putin regime and the many millions of Russians whose liberties are disappearing and whose standards of living is in severe decline. The modern history of Russia and the Soviet Union make it clear that its ideas and its ambitions matter a great deal on the global stage. The shocks after the 1917 revolution were felt around the world. Mussolini followed in Lenin footsteps. Several generations, including my own, grew up behind an iron curtain of fear. Those who say that the current Russian economy is a success should realize that GDP is not the best measure of achievement. The most important measurements of Russia today are the lack of free press, the persecution of political opposition, and the steady demolition of democratic institutions. With every new billionaire Kremlin crony, we have tens of thousands of ordinary Russians out of sight and falling fast. There have been other major reversals. The oligarchs today are themselves top state officials. Aristotle himself couldn't find a better definition of oligarchy than what we have in the Kremlin today. Top Putin administration members chair some of the largest corporations in the country, such as Gazprom, Rosneft, and Transneft. You might even wonder if there is a Russian term for conflict of interest. <laughs> Russia likely has the richest government in the world on an individual level. In the West, many millionaires enter politics. In Russia, they usually become wealth after joining the administration. 
First, Putin's bunch took justice into their own hands, and then they put the state coffers into their pockets. With this expertise in creative money management, perhaps Putin can retire and run a hedge fund. <laughs> the stagnant Soviet economy has been replaced by energy wealth for very few Russians. But as you heard from Putin himself just two days ago in Munich, intimidation is again becoming an important, uh, an important expert, element of export. Russia is again becoming a heaven and ally for the world's most dangerous regimes. We all know that much of the world, especially the United States, is distracted with the catastrophe in Iraq. But do not forget, it's only one small area of the global chessboard, and not even, the, in my view at least, not, <laughs> not even the most important part. I'm sure many in DC disagree. It's hard to believe anyone could underestimate the potential danger of a wealthy, aggressive, and nuclear Russian petrostate that has no respect for the rule of law inside or, in, inside or outside its borders. And yet, I constantly read about Russia's stability and Putin's popularity, which are really two sides of the same myth. Stability. So regarding Putin's popularity, you first have to stop making comparisons about polls between Russia and other countries. We only recently escaped the oppression of the all-seeing Soviet dictatorship, and our president is a KGB spy. When someone, who, someone, calls you at home and asks you